Professional Open Source Radio Astronomy by Jason Manley. Yeah, thanks very much. So I think I've made a bit of a blasphemous move bringing my Mac here today. But uh, the other seven computers that I run all run Debian or Debian derivatives, so I don't feel like I'm in bad company. <laughs> and I've managed to convert my parents as well, so it's, uh, it's looking pretty good, I think. So I'm here to talk about radio astronomy today. Uh, the talk's going to be kept pretty kind of informal and uh, not very technical. It's kind of a high-level overview and just to kind of give you a flavor, so lots of pictures and things. Um, this is what we're talking about. So we're building these uh, big dishes. They look like giant satellite TV dishes. Uh, this is actually a picture of Meerkat, one of our, uh, the, the array that we're currently building out in the Karoo. Um, and we don't just build one of these things. We're building an array of them. So that's a picture taken uh, uh, very recently on our site. Uh, and Meerkat has about 64 of these things. They're, they're about 13 and a half meters across. Uh, and the whole thing is based on a, a very flexible, uh, reprogrammable software-defined radio that's all open source. Uh, there's about two petaops per second of, of processing capacity in there. Uh, it doesn't sound very high compared to today's supercomputers, but um, we're only burning 26 kilowatts to do that. It's very power efficient. Um, and we're, very, we're dominated by I.O. Um, for two petaops a second, we've got 15 terabits per second of data being exchanged. And that drives us into, to, towards building sort of custom hardware rather than buying off the shelf things. Uh, interestingly, we do direct digitization, so there's no analog down conversion. Those of you familiar with radio astronomy and sort of analog radio. Um, and it will be the world's most sensitive L-band instrument when we finish building it next year. Uh, so why are we building this thing? Well, it's kind of a flagship project for the country. Um, we want to show off our, our capability, as it were. So we, we're building this world-class telescope. But we also want to attract and retain scientists and engineers. A, a large part of our project is human capital development. We invest about a third of our budget into students. Um, we fund about 400 students at university. Uh, and so we want to inspire a new generation to sort of pursue ca uh, careers in, in science and engineering. Uh, we also try to stimulate the, the local economy. So we uh, use local industry wherever possible to build this thing. Um, and it's actually a, a pathfinder for a future telescope called the Square Kilometer Array that's coming uh, that will be built throughout the world. And uh, those of you who follow these sorts of things in the news may have heard of this announcement a couple of years back. We won the right to host the Square Kilometer Array on our site right next to Meerkat. So that's what we're working towards. Um, and the site where we're building this thing is protected. Uh, we have um, legislation in place that prevents you from putting radio transmitters up there. RFI is a very big concern. It's radio frequency interference. You can't come near us with a cell phone or two-way radio or anything. And I'll, I'll try and explain a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and where are we talking about? Uh, there's a map of our country there. And there's a section uh, towards the northwest that's sort of almost circled in blue for those of you following online. Uh, and that is the protected region of our country. This is a map of population density. Uh, down here in Cape Town, in the sort of bottom left corner there, it's red. It's very densely populated. But out in the Northern Cape, where we're building this thing, the color is gray. And that's not to two people per square kilometer. And I say people, but actually, I think it's just sheep. There's like nothing <laughs> out there. Um, and that's very important, because we, we don't want people polluting the radio spectrum. It looks something like this, uh, mostly rocks and kind of scrub vegetation. It's, it's a semi-desert region. And there are these little hills uh, that actually provide a bit of shielding from terrestrial transmitters that are a few hundred kilometers away. So it's kind of the ideal place to build this. And there are very few places in the world that offer this kind of environment. Um, so this is one of the arrays that's currently on our site. And if you zoom out a little bit, you'll see seven of these things standing there. Uh, but we hope by 2020 it might look something more like this uh, if, uh, if we start building the square kilometer array there. Um, and in fact, these dishes would not just be based in South Africa. They'd be spread out through, throughout the continent uh, all the way up to Ghana. So we have lots of um, other countries involved in this as well. Now, radio astronomy has a, a fairly long history. Um, uh, or rather astronomy does, radio astronomy is a bit shorter. Uh, Carl Jansky discovered the first radio waves from space in 1929, uh, but Greta Rieber in 1937 was the first person to actually build a telescope for the purposes of, of listening to uh, signals uh, from space. Uh, Jansky sort of stumbled across them while trying to solve 
uh, the problem of uh, radio uh, telephone calls across the Atlantic, and he discovered this interfering source coming from space. Uh, so we sort of happened uh, upon this uh, science. Uh, but you'll see this dish on the right looks remarkably similar to the way we build dishes now, and that was the first one ever done. Uh, so um, the basics have been pretty much the same uh, ever since it started. In the early days, things were pretty simple. You, you built the dish as big as possible to make it as sensitive as possible. The processing was all done in analog, and the computing back end was a guy with a pen and pencil. Uh, the problem with this sort of approach is you can only build these things so big, so you, you sort of run into a sensitivity problem eventually. And the largest fully steerable telescope in the world is the Green Bank Telescope. It's about 100 meters across, weighs 7,300 tons. Uh, to kind of put this in perspective, imagine picking up a football stadium and turning it around at the sky. That, that's the size of these things. Um, and in fact, that it's, it's, um, it's a problem because uh, the thing weighs so much, when you move it around, its own weight deforms the surface. So you have little motors that actively correct for the surface deformation. Uh, but what happens if that's not big enough? You still want it more sensitive. Well, you have to build it into the ground. So if you've ever watched uh, the James Bond fans who've seen GoldenEye might recognize this. Uh, it doesn't fill with water, and there's not a baddie's lair under there. But um, it is kind of a spectacular bit of engineering. Uh, and this was in 1960. Uh, this is 300 meters across, uh, and at the moment, there's a bigger one under construction in China called FAST. That one's 500 meters across, and they reckon they're going to finish it by 2017, so today it's pretty far along already. But when you get to these sorts of scales, uh, there are all sorts of limitations. You, you sort of pointed straight up at the sky, and you can move the focal point around a little bit so you can steer it a little bit, but you can't look at anything you want. You kind of have to wait for the Earth to rotate back around uh, to see that thing again. Um, and also, the bigger you go, the narrower your beam gets on the sky, so you see a smaller part of the sky. So if you want to do a survey, if you're looking for something, uh, it takes you a lot longer to do that. Now, why are we trying to build these things so big? And the reason is to try and collect more energy. Um, to sort of try and put this in perspective, imagine a 100-watt light bulb that you turn on and off. So on for a second, you burn about 28 milliwatt hours of, of energy. Uh, if we run a 26-meter uh, dish, uh, and we look at the brightest source in the southern hemisphere, Virgo A, uh, 12 hours every night for 10 years, you'll only collect a thousandth of that energy. So these things are really, really sensitive. Um, uh, the signals that we're trying to detect are really, really weak. What happens if you put a baby monitor on the moon? Could we detect that? Not only can we detect it, but it's 10 times brighter than the brightest source we observe. Um, so if you walk next to one of these dishes with a cell phone, you blow them up. And they're really expensive, so we don't let people on site with cell phones. Uh, so rather than trying to build these things bigger, we build more of them. And so uh, the start of this was sort of the very large array in 1980. This one's still uh, very popular. Uh, if you've seen the movie Contact, you might recognize this. Um, so these are, uh, I think, 20-odd uh, meter dishes. Uh, and they're 20-odd of them, something thereabouts. And the kind of fundamentals of this is you can imagine a, a source up there somewhere in space, and there's signals coming down from it. And they arrive on the surface, and these dishes are in slightly different positions, and the signal hits them at slightly different times. So what we're trying to measure is that delay, and then you can work out where in the sky the source was. That's sort of the basic concept. Um, so in South Africa, we're kind of new to this field. We haven't been doing this very long. Uh, and so we've, we've gone through a few different designs to get towards this meerkat array that we're building. We started out with an ex experimental development model, uh, which was just a single antenna. And then we went to CAT7. That's seven of these things that's been running since about 2010. Uh, and now we're busy building meerkat. And those of you with a sharp eye might notice that these things look subtly different. Uh, the first two on the left are what we call prime focus. There are legs supporting a feed structure in the middle of it. But meerkat is what's called a Gregorian offset. Um, and the reason for this is to avoid any um, thing sitting between the sky and your dish. So these lines are a little bit fainter with the lights on, but essentially the signal comes into this main reflector, this big dish here, and then bounces off to a sub-reflector and then hits the receiver. And there's nothing sitting in the aperture 
uh, of this main reflector. So you get a very clean signal, no multipathing. Uh, and this is a stepping stone towards this big international project called the Square Kilometer Array, which is which sort of consists of three parts, this uh, dense aperture array thing, some dishes like these pictures you've been seeing, and then something called sparse aperture arrays. And the sparse aperture arrays are going to be built in Australia, but the dense aperture arrays and dishes are coming to Africa. Uh, and they might look something like this. These are artist's impressions, of course. These are the dishes. Uh, you can have lots of them. Uh, dense aperture arrays look sort of like these tiles that are on the ground, uh, and the sparse aperture arrays are, are sort of dipoles staring at the sky. Um, now, the focus of this talk is sort of on the, the processing side of this. Uh, my role in, in this lot is, is the initial upfront signal processing of these systems, which is now all digital. Uh, in the early days of, of digital instrumentation, it was done with discrete logic. That's 74 series ICs. And they were actually still in use up until just a few, few years ago. Uh, so, you know, over a 30-year lifespan that these things ran. Um, so you build these, these cards with all the logic on, and then you kind of stack them in, in these racks, and you've got a room full of these things to, to build a correlator this size. And the current state of the art is to do this using ASICs. Uh, so this is the EVLA. It's an upgraded version of, of that very large array in New Mexico. Um, and you basically take a PCB, you build them as big as you can. Some of them are two meters square, and you just pack them with ASICs. And you slot them into these big chassis cabinets, and you put lots and lots of cabinets in the room, and you kind of connect them all with ribbon cables uh, and hope you haven't miswired something. Um, and a lot of people ask me, well, can't you just do this with software now? I mean, that was 74 series logic in the 80s. You know, surely by now we can just put an Intel CPU there and we're done. And it turns out you kind of can. You can replace this old 74 series logic with about 153 gigahertz CPUs. Um, and today's sort of cutting edge correlators built using those ASICs would need something like 200,000 CPUs. So these systems are pretty big. We crunch big numbers. Uh, and you can, you can improve this by using accelerators like you know, GPUs or cell processors or whatever the flavor of the month is. Um, but uh, these things are all pretty power hungry. And it's difficult to get the data into these devices. Um, computers aren't really good for high bandwidth applications. Uh, so when we came to building CAT7, which was deployed in 2010, we sort of started with a bit of a clean sheet. We said, OK, <coughs> there are all these other ways of doing these things. If we were to do it now from scratch, given our current technology, how can we do this? What's the best way to go about it? And uh, one of the concepts was to have kind of a building blocks that you can use, if you will. You can kind of clip all these building blocks together to build different types of instruments, because you do different science with these uh, telescopes. Um, and to scale the system uh, dynamically, as it were, by just adding more and more hardware. So you could build pocket spectrometers and channelizers and all sorts of different things all out of these same building blocks just by sort of connecting them up differently. Uh, and when you run out of space on one board, well, you can connect multiple boards together. And when you aren't able to connect multiple boards together anymore, you can plug them all into a big network switch and just sort of keep scaling this thing out. And uh, so we came up with a sort of concept diagram where we have uh, dishes here on the left plugged into something called F-engines. It's, it's sort of a, it's a channelizer. Uh, and then it goes into a big network switch. And then you have a whole bunch of processing nodes hanging off this. And it turns out um, we weren't the only ones thinking along these lines. Uh, the Collaboration for Astronomy, Signal Processing, and Electronics Research, or CASPER, which started at UC Berkeley, uh, tried to create the kind of PC of radio astronomy. So the idea is to sort of accelerate and streamline the development of these instruments, which can take over 10 years sometimes. Um, and in, in so doing, sort of better track Moore's law. You know, we want to use low-cost commodity hardware you, want to use, uh, you don't want to have to redevelop the system every time you upgrade it. You want to reuse what you can. So can't you come up with some sort of platform independent DSP library? You want to use standard communication protocols that it's easy to interface with other equipment. Um, and the idea is to sort of develop this quickly, deploy it late, and upgrade it often. Much more you know, similar to what you would do with a laptop. Uh, and critically, if we can get lots of people behind this, then the non-recoverable engineering cost would be really low, and you can share it across the community. Whatever you develop, whatever I develop, we can share it. And if we develop different things, then we both gain uh, you know, what the other person's done. 
So traditionally, as, as I say, it takes over five years to develop one of these instruments. Um, to put this in perspective, Casper has been really successful. In their first two years, they built eight instruments. Um, and the cost is a whole lot lower than these things normally would be. It's, it's normally tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and uh, these Casper-like instruments are typically under a million. So we use something called a Simulink environment. That's the programming environment for these things. It's, it's actually graphics-based. Simulink is a MathWorks MATLAB uh, sort of add-on, and it's the only non-free part of our tool flow at the moment. Uh, but you kind of drag and drop these modules out of a library, and you connect them up with little arrows, and you hit a compile button. And this was pretty novel when we started doing this sort of circa 2008, 2009. But now it's fairly common. And this map in the bottom right here shows the collaborators at the Casper uh, workshop some few years ago. Uh, so we use these open source hardware platforms. This was sort of the first generation one. Uh, this was called the B2, which stands for Berkeley Emulation Engine. This board was actually designed uh, to simulate multi-core uh, processors. Uh, so Microsoft and Intel were some of the big customers for these boards. And back then, it had incredible specs, 24 gigs of memory and 180 gigabits of I.O. It sounded amazing. Now it's like, yeah, whatever. Um, but the problem with that thing was there was no way to get analog signals into it. Uh, so you couldn't digitize your antenna data. So then they built this other thing called the Internet Breakout Board, whose sole purpose it was was to digitize signals, get it into the B2s for processing. And that worked well enough. Um, but we thought... Oh, my animations aren't working so well, sorry. So we came up with something called the roach. And uh, in America, roach means marijuana. Um, that's not what this means. This stands for reconfigurable open architecture computing hardware. And it was kind of the one platform to rule them all. Uh, it rolled in the functions of the IBOB and the B2 into a single platform. You could digitize signals with this. You could do your processing on here. Um, and uh, this has been really successful. We, we sort of designed this thing for CAT7, uh, but we open sourced it, and it's now in use throughout the world. Most radio astronomy facilities have one of these boards in their pipeline somewhere. Um, typically, we use the biggest FPGA device available at the time. That's a field programmable gate array, for those of you not familiar with it. And the kind of idea is it's like a CPU that you can rewire the innards of. So you can implement your algorithms in hardware rather than in software. So we have this sort of big FPGA device, and then we put a lot of memory on it and lots of I.O. Uh, and then there's a little coprocessor on these boards as well that runs Debian. Uh, and it has some out-of-band hardware monitoring. You know, this predates IDRAX and things. And we tried to keep it backwards and forwards compatible. So we use Ethernet communication standard. It's been around for you know, 20, 30 years. And we, think it's, we hope it's going to be around for another 20, 30 years, because our telescope has to last 30 years. Um, so you, build this, you kind of take this one building block, and then you stick a whole bunch of them in a rack and wire them all up together in a network. And you get a cluster of these things, as you do in ordinary computers. Um, and it seems to work pretty well. So then we built the second generation board called Roach 2, not very original. Uh, and it's just sort of bigger, better, faster, and unfortunately also more expensive. Um, and these boards have come, become sort of the Casper de facto standard building blocks. Uh, and then when it came to build the third generation board, uh, which you'd think the next generation would be called Roach 3, it's not, it's called Scarab, but it's the same thing. Uh, and we relabeled re that uh, to, to sort of bring it in line with uh, the upcoming SKA array. We wanted SKA in the name somewhere, but it, it's the same thing, bigger, better, faster version. Uh, and it looks something like this. Those of you who were here yesterday afternoon may have seen the demo I was giving. Uh, this is just a slide showing uh, sort of some of the uh, capabilities of the board. Uh, I guess the only thing to kind of highlight here is even the Roach 2 that is some, you know, many years old now, already had memory bandwidths of over 200 gigabits per second, which was many factors over what was available on typical computers at the time. And these things are now in use all over at GMRT in India and the ATA in the States, and they have a whole bunch of other arrays coming online that would, could also be using this stuff. Um, and we kind of have some strange requirements. These things operate out in the desert. They stand alone. Um, so, you know, they have to run remotely very reliably. Uh, we have to design the system to cope with failures, uh, and we need to design it with a long lifetime in mind. So no single hardware platform is going to last 30 years. You, you're going to have to, at some point, service it and upgrade it. And 
You know, how do you go about doing that? You have to pick your hardware and software very carefully. This is what the development environment looks like. It's not your average text-based uh, IDE. Um, but you kind of have blocks representing different things in the system. Some of these represent I.O. parts, ADCs and DACs and things. Some of them represent signal processing tasks. And then you kind of wire it all together and hit compile and it programs your board and runs your function. So we have a pretty big DSP library. We do digital down converters, fast Fourier transforms, polyphase filter banks, uh, multiply and accumulate, data reorders, all sorts of things, all the typical radio astronomy building blocks. And we try to make these things configurable. So it's, it's a library of components that you can adjust parameters on, and it will consume more or less hardware resources depending on what you do or what you're trying to do. You can tweak things like the amount of bandwidth that you're processing, if it's real or complex numbers, how many streams you want to process in parallel, uh, tweak bit widths and so on. Most of the stuff we do is, is uh, integer. It's not floating point. Um, and this has worked really well for us. Instead of taking years to develop these systems, we built a, a dish monitoring system in a month, built an RFI monitoring spectrometer, the same one I was showing off yesterday in one week. Uh, and it took us six months to build the CAT7 correlator, a whole lot less than the 10 years people were estimating. Uh, and this is kind of uh, the first sort of science that came out of CAT7. Um, we ran it through uh, a standard set of observations and compared it to existing known observations to see if the system actually worked. Uh, and the results uh, looked pretty similar. It was quite good. That was one dish. And then when we first connected two dishes, we tried to see if we could measure this time difference. And you get something called fringes. This is the wrapping of the phase of the um, difference in the two signals. Um, and then when we had a whole bunch of these uh, antennas together, the first four, we tried to uh, make an image. And we managed to, that was what the image looked like with a single dish. And with multiple, you can actually zoom in on that piece and you can see that there are actually two things, or you would if the light weren't shining on the board. Uh, and then um, we tried to do a little bit of science with it. And it turns out we could uh, do science from about 1982. Uh, so we weren't quite where we needed to be, but it demonstrated that the system worked. Uh, and you could, uh, you could actually pick out uh, individual parts of what is this, 1977, so we were not quite cutting edge yet. But that's kind of where Meerkat comes in. Um, so Meerkat is the sort of final telescope that uh, our government is funding. It's our last step towards the square kilometer array. And we learned a lot uh, from the XDM and CAT7, and we've implemented all of these fixes in, in Meerkat. It, this will be the world's best telescope. Uh, we digitize at the feed now, so the dishes are no longer analog. They're digital. They bring back Ethernet data straight from there. So the analog paths have been kept really short, uh, and that gives you much better uh, fidelity in your data. Uh, and this time domain data comes straight into a giant network switch, and we hang off a whole bunch of processors, and those could be Roach-3s or Scarabs or any CPU or GPU or whatever other processor you want. Anything you can plug into a network switch, you can use to process this data. Um, and what's interesting is the switch in the middle is multicast. So you can now have multiple devices processing the same set of data. So you can have multiple science projects running at the same time. That will be a world first. Um, I can't go into too much detail for Meerkat because I'm kind of under gag orders. Uh, those of you interested in this should keep an eye on the papers. In two weeks' time, there's going to be a really big announcement. Um, that's about all I can say, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, 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 nothing like that. Um, we, we have not finished building Meerkat, so only the first 16 antennas are in place. So uh, there's not that much we can do with, with 16 antennas, but uh, there's already been some new stuff there. Uh, someone asked me yesterday about how do we time these things, and the answer is with hydrogen mazes. Uh, so timing is critical. The thing we're trying to determine is the different time of arrival of the signals at the various dishes. Uh, so we, we have very accurate clocks to do that. Um, and as I say, all this stuff's open, the hardware, the software, everything. There are about 150 repositories at our GitHub account. Uh, lots of software projects, some hardware projects. Um, so the... CAD designs, you know, 
schematics, PCB layouts, everything is, is uh, in here if you want to make your own hardware. Uh, all the supporting software is there as well. Uh, so that's kind of the overview, yeah. Have some time for questions. Wow. Great talk. So yeah, I think you already raised your hand during the talk. So the switch that you have there, um, is that a commercial switch or do you do it? No, it's commercial. Um, uh, we, we kind of uh, would prefer to just buy everything off the shelf if we could, to be honest. Um, and the only reason we go and develop this custom hardware is just because we can't find any other pro products out there that can do what we want. So that's why we sort of develop that. But in terms of switches and you know, the computers that monitor the network and control these things, it's, it's all off the shelf stuff wherever we can. I'm very curious about your digitizer architecture. You said you're direct digitizing at L band, and yet your sampling frequency looks like it's below Nyquist for that band. Um, what are you doing? I'm just curious. Um, yeah. So. Uh, and, and, the, and what's the bandwidth? I guess is the other interesting question. So Meerkat uh, digitizes 856 megahertz at L band. There are four different bands. There's UHF, L band, S band, X band. X band is the widest one. That's kind of six giga, gigahertz bandwidth. Um, so with Nyquist, what's important is not the highest operating frequency, but the bandwidth. So uh, 856 megahertz band, you sample at 1712 megahertz. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, for a non-radio astronomer, um, what's the like? What's the what do you lose? Um, when you move from a very big dish of a certain size to multiple little dishes. I mean, I realize there's the practical that you cannot get that and you, you need that, but do you lose uh, relative resolution or? Yeah. or it's a good question and uh, I should have covered that. Um, the, the answer is you're trading off mechanical cost for electrical cost. Um, essentially with an array, you have to multiply every baseline. A baseline is a pair of antennas. So it's an order N squared processing problem. So to build a small array of seven dishes is trivial. To build an array of 64 starts becoming interesting. To build an array like square kilometer array with thousands of dishes at the moment looks pretty impossible. Uh, we think we can do it, but it's a really hard problem. Uh, it will generate more data than the entire internet combined, something like 50 times over, uh, that we have to process in real time. So it's, it's a proper challenge. Uh, and the data is streaming. There's no dead time. You can't record it and then go off and churn on it later. Um, but what you gain is being able to observe a bigger part of the sky, because if you make a single big dish, the beam narrows. With lots of little dishes, the beam's quite wide, uh, but the cost is more electronics to process the signal. Okay, so computationally, but resolution-wise and everything else is... Important. Yeah. Hi. Uh, maybe you can explain a bit the, uh, about the openness of the data. Um, so Meerkat has a vision. Uh, we would like to make all of the data available um, to anyone and everyone. Uh, so the idea is there will be a web portal, and you can kind of see the last six months of observations, and you click on one of them and ask you what format you want to download it in, and it will even do on-the-fly conversion to put it in the appropriate package for you. And you can then sit and turn on it on your laptop if you want. Um, yeah, it might be a bit of a tough task given the data rates, but uh, you know, if, you, if you're at a university or something and you've got access to a big cluster, uh, you could do science and we'll give you the data for free. So uh, they'll be broken up into chunks, maybe 20 minute observations or something. So yeah, they'll be maybe a bit smaller, <laughs> yeah. Yes, you said um, that you couldn't use any cell phones or radios near the, uh, the actual antennas. So what do you use on site to communicate with your teams? It's a real problem, actually. Um, in many ways, we're our own worst enemy. So we have little metal boxes with IP phones in them with fiber going in there. So you can, you know, like telephone booths back in the day. Um, for emergency communications, they're two-way radios. And we've, um, we've, we've selected the radios to operate at a frequency that's outside of our band. But even so, just having them there uh, is a problem, and you can't do science while someone's talking on it. Um, you know, to try and put this in perspective, there's a, there's a great picture outside Green Bank where they, they show the signal coming in, and then there's all this garbage, and then the signal carries on. And 
on, when you're on the tour, you kind of say, what is this blip here? What happened? It all went screwy. They say, oh, that's when some tourist turned on their digital camera. Um, so you, 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 you really have to be careful, and it's, it's the reason why we're out there in the middle of nowhere. It's to discourage people from doing things like that. But the computers you use to, to do all of this, that's shielded, or how is that working? It's buried underground um, in a bunkered facility, very, you know, James Bond-like. <laughs> There's another question there. The FPGAs, what do you like about them, and what would you change about them? Because presumably the FPGAs, the commercial FPGAs, are just general purpose. What would you like? So they do lots of different families of FPGAs. Um, you know, they might have one that has lots of I.O., and that's targeting kind of the networking market. Um, Cisco and these big guys use a lot of those FPGAs. Um, then they have other kinds of FPGAs that are DSP targeted. Those are the ones we use, so doing a lot of digital signal processing. And uh, the ratios of the sort of primitives inside there are different. So they might have a little bit more memory in there um, and some more multiply, multipliers, but less uh, I.O., for example. And historically, we've always just gone for the biggest one that had everything. Um, but uh, they're also starting to run into this problem that the GPU guys hit a few years ago where you're now limited by kind of how much heat you can get out the chip and how big physically you can make the packages. Um, so we're starting to run into this issue where we're having to trade one thing off for another. We can't just have the biggest and most of everything. Uh, and so now we have to select kind of the FPGA very, very carefully. Uh, it, it turns out that they're still a good mix for us. Uh, you know, obviously DSP is a big target market for these guys. The military also use it a lot for radar systems and kind of tracking stations and things. Uh, and their application computationally is very similar to ours. Uh, so we, we use parts that are designed for that kind of thing. Are there any more questions? Yeah. So you've got a custom hardware platform. And you're talking about these things being around for 30 plus design year live. How do you keep up with the change? Uh, your favorite FPGA is going to be obsolete next month. Yeah. Um, and step and repeat that for most of the other semiconductors. That is absolutely true. Um, and it, it's, it's a problem that the other telescope facilities have solved by buying a lifetime supply of all the parts and just keeping it in a big storeroom. We don't like that. It's, it's a valid approach, uh, but it's very expensive. Um, so what we're trying to do, and time will tell if this works, uh, is keep um, sort of industry standard interfaces with the idea to replace the, what we call line replaceable units. So you know, we're talking about Roach 1, Roach 2, scarab boards today. In 10 years time, it could be something completely different. But as long as you can still plug it into the network and still compile the design for that platform, in theory, it's the same thing. So if my laptop fails today, you know, I'm not going to buy this model. I'll buy a different model. But if it can run all the same software, in our minds, that's the same thing. If it can still accept the data through a network port, it's the same thing. Um, so that, that's the vision. Your, your last comment made me remind, made me remember um, a medical imaging processing company, which will remain nameless, that has these clinical trials that go on for 5, 10, 15 plus years, yeah. but found out that a lot of the software and a lot of bugs happen where it turned out to be machine dependent and architecture dependent, mm. which is unfortunate, but apparently happens. And yeah. so when they try to change to a newer generation of things, uh, if you were to try and reproduce the uh, software analysis, it turns out you get different results. Mm. So I don't know if it will affect you or if yeah. you have test cases to sort of check that, oh, your results are actually consistent across 10 years plus. We, uh, we're the first telescope facility to do something called system engineering. It's a, it's a very robust kind of process to validate y y your system. Uh, it's a lot of military institutions use the same kind of approach. Um, that gets us part way. The other way we're trying to deal with that is by open sourcing all of this. We have a lot of other people around the world using it, sometimes on different hardware platforms uh, and sometimes in very different systems. And they uncover bugs. You know, no one's perfect. There are bugs in things. Um, but the hope is that by diversifying as much as possible, 
you will uncover these things more quickly. Uh, okay, so who is using uh, you, the the tools you are developing, uh, the, the open source tools? Is it uh, other, in, other institutes or uh, 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 amateur, amateur astronomers? Them as well. Um, you know, I, I titled the talk professional radio astronomy because one of these boards typically cost around 10,000 US. They're pretty pricey. So for an amateur astronomer to get a hold of that and start using it is, is, is hard. Um, they mostly can't afford it. But most of the big... Uh, radio telescope facilities around the world have one of these boards somewhere in their system now. And, uh, and, and so they use these tools. And you know, if you're going to ask me to name some of them now, I, I, I probably could, but I just embarrass myself because I'll leave someone off the list and they'll be unhappy with me. <laughs> but um, there are probably about five or six dozen institutions around the world using them now um, with various generations of, of the hardware in, you know, that, that have been deployed. A lot of the big universities also use them. Uh, in the States, they, they, you know, students play on these things and, and develop algorithms and things on them. Um, so it's even started to be used a little bit outside of radio astronomy. So the boards are pretty generic. And they're very cheap compared to other FPJ boards like this. Hi, thank you. Um, I'd just like to know, you growing a pool of, of uh, talent and uh, uh, intellectual skills, etc. Um, where are you sourcing people from, and who are you cross-pollinating with? No, uh, where are people moving on to from yeah. from you? Uh, that's a good question. So, uh, as I say, about a third of our budget goes into developing people. We can't employ all of them. Um, so we fund about 400 students. Our engineering offices only employ about 200. So uh, a lot of those students go into other fields. Um, and we're not very picky about the sort of students we fund in terms of what they research. Uh, obviously, we prefer for them to research something related to us, but we, we would fund students doing any science and uh, you know, technology, some sort of engineering-based project. Uh, so some of them work in completely different fields. And that's okay. Uh, as long as people are learning and excited about this stuff, we feel we're doing our job. So, any more questions? I also don't see any questions from IRC, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>